Amen. Hey, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you are our good shepherd and that you never leave us nor forsake us. And Lord, we thank you that even though we go astray, that we fail every day, you continue to run hard after us and you never tire of pulling us out of our mess. Lord, I pray that you will remind us today of how much you love us. We thank you that you have extended your grace to us, that you have forgiven us. And Lord, I pray for those who don't know you today, that they will turn to you and realize without you, Lord, we are in trouble. We perish apart from you. And so we turn our attention to you, our heart's affection toward you now, as we open your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, go ahead and grab your Bible. Um, what a great, great time of worship today. You already sense this beautiful image of the Good Shepherd. I love this image that Jesus gives to us. In fact, who he is for us. We're going to talk about it today. You can turn to John 10, in fact, is where we're going to be. Um, hey, this past Monday, I had the privilege of being at, uh, speaking at chapel at DBU. Many of you know uh, Dallas Baptist University. We love Dallas Baptist University. Love Dr. Adam Wright. Um, who is the president there, good friend, and um, he and his wife, his family serve here in our church. And I was talking to the students, and it, it reminded me, and in fact, I, I said that, you know, being in college, in your early 20s, is a lot like being on a merry-go-round, you know, like out in the playground, get in the middle of it, you're just going around if you can do it. It's hard enough to keep your balance. But then um, going in one direction, and then the other direction, let's say there's, there's a target, but it's rotating the other way. And then in your 20s, they give you like a bow and arrow and they say, okay, hit the target, right? And you're like, okay, I can't even, I can't even set my focus on it. And you're asked then to uh, hit the target. You got to decide what your major is going to be. If you're in college, you got to determine what your vocation will be, where you're going to work, maybe where you're going to live. Sometimes people are, am I going to get married? Am I not? All kinds of big time decisions. And and I I challenge the students with what I want to challenge us with today. Wouldn't it be great? If we had some guidance, like someone who could just walk with us, who knows us better than we know ourselves, who could say, hey, I know I have my best intentions for you, and I know exactly how to guide you in the midst of a million voices that are coming to us. And of course, we do have a guide. We have a good shepherd who can lead us. Now, here's what I didn't tell the students. They don't know experientially. Well, I guess I told them, um, after you get out of college, you still need a good shepherd, right? We need someone to guide us through every stage of life. And so today I want us to really focus in on the beauty of our good shepherd. And I hope that to create in you, I know the spirit alone can do this, a longing for the shepherd. We're going to look at at the love of the shepherd and we're going to talk about life with the shepherd all right so in john 10 uh, i want to ask you this question first all of our members of the church how many of you are reading through our dwell plan how many of you are doing it right now no you're not lying in church you're just like i am Um, i'm doing this uh because we are a church family i've said this before gang i'm the shepherd pastor under shepherd of a local church and if you're a member this we're family we're all doing this together If you've not yet joined us, jump in because this week you read chapters 7 through 10 of John. Friday, you read the whole chapter. So you're ahead of the game and I don't have to, you know, spend all the time going through the whole chapter because you've read it. You're already thinking about this with us. uh, But to place it in context, which is so important, um, chapters 7 through 10, um, we were reading this week. Chapter 8, we read where Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And then at the end, let's see, in chapter 9, he literally turns on the light for a blind man who couldn't see, creates all kinds of a stir there in the temple, and the Pharisees don't know what to do with this guy. Now think about that for a minute. He's so radically changed. They actually send him out. They interrogate him. They don't like him. He's causing too much trouble. They don't know what to do with him. They send him out. Jesus goes and finds him because Jesus embraces those who the religious establishment have rejected. They have sent him out. And in an ironic twist, John 9 ends with Jesus saying to the Pharisees, you are blind because you think you can see. 
And then this sets up chapter 10. And the first thing I want to see here is the longing for the shepherd. All right. Let's talk about this longing for the shepherd. Now, before we get there again, context is everything. He's been talking, if you can track with me, the first part of, of John 10. He's been talking about, he uses two, two analogies here mixed together. Uh, he's the door is what he says. And then he's going to shift to, well, he's the good shepherd. But we talked about it last week. Uh, the larger context is that Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, throughout the history of God's people, we are described as, as sheep and his under shepherds that he's placed over us, you know, prophets and leaders throughout the ages are to be the good shepherds. Um, they're to be good and really serve the people well. But the prophets, they called out those shepherds, those prof- the prophets called out the leaders and said, you know, you're not in fact, caring for the sheep. And in Ezekiel 34, he says, you're not going after the stray ones, the the sheep who've gone astray. You're not not feeding them. In fact, he says, you're devouring them. It's a graphic depiction of this exploitation of the sheep. I mean, when we, those who are called to protect and guard and guide us, instead are like thieves and robbers and they jump us. It's one thing to be jumped, right, by a robber, a thief. A liar, someone out there. It's quite another thing when those who are called to protect and guard and guide don't do so. It's why this week we've all been been just shaken by the death of Tyree Nichols. Right? Now we know that 99.9% all all, you know, officers, policemen that I know personally, and, and those who serve us here every week, they put their lives on the line for us. And we praise God for those who are in charge and given the charge to protect and guide us. So when they don't, it shocks us. And Jesus now is turning to these Pharisees. In fact, in John 10, verse 8, he says, the all who've gone before me, all who've gone before me, and that's what he's referring to. They, they, they've not led you well. They've not been good shepherds. So you can see how then he contrasts himself here in this passage. He's going to say that I, I, I am the good shepherd. Now, when we were in Israel just recently, we saw shepherds. Now, not much has changed um, over the past 2,000 years. You can imagine um, it's shepherding. But, you know, we don't, we don't have to be a shepherd to understand kind of what's happening here. Now, here's, here's what is going on. And it's, it's important for this passage. When you look at a sheepfold, he starts to mention in the first part of chapter uh, 10, a sheepfold in town would be like a courtyard. And several families would keep their sheep, different flock, in one area there'd be a gatekeeper you know who'd guard at night kind of a thing to keep thieves and others predators out now in the in the rural areas they do the same we saw this they would build um little areas out of stone high enough okay didn't have to go too high for a sheep they don't have a lot of ups you know they don't have a lot of vertical uh, leaping going on and so it's pretty simple to keep them in their place and and they guide and, and, and and protect them but but i've i've learned this in the global west, okay, so I've been, to, I've been to New Zealand where there's like five sheep to every person in New Zealand. I've been to Australia. I've been to other places, Canada, here in the States, in fact. Um, Shepherd's Guide, and fun fact, do you know which state has the most sheep of all states in the United States? Texas. Let's, we're winning. I mean, we're always winning. But... Um, but what happens in the West is they guide and, and kind of prod and poke their, their sheep or maybe a dog. But in Israel, they actually lead out and the sheep follow behind the shepherd. Um, and this is the beautiful picture of what it is to be a Christian, to be following Jesus. I love this whole image. Then in verse 10, here we go. He, he offers this pivotal statement where he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Then again, he's, he's talking to the Pharisees. We pull this out of context, often say, well, he's talking about Satan, who is the ultimate murderer, liar, destroyer. But he says, I come, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is that word we've talked about. John loves this word, zoe, abundant, eternal, everlasting life here and now and forever, Okay. So these self-proclaimed shepherds have not been leading well. And Jesus says, I've come in contrast to give life. So in verse 11, here it is, I am. 
We've said this, ego a mi, I am, I am. The good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, it's interesting to note here, Jesus is wearing this um, designation, this, this label proudly. You know, throughout uh, Israel's history, you probably know, a- Abraham, Moses, David was the great, you know, all were shepherds. But the Pharisees and the rabbis did not look upon shepherds at, at this time in the high regard. Uh, they're, they're low class people, right? We talked about that over, over Christmas. Yet Jesus does not hesitate to describe himself as the good shepherd. They might have cringed a little bit. But here's what's happening. Charles Spurgeon helps us here. He says this, according to the text, Jesus greatly rejoices in the fact that he is the good shepherd. He's not ashamed of it. But he repeats it in this chapter so many times it almost reads like a refrain of a song. He rejoices in it. It is to his heart's content that he congratulates himself upon it. I am the good shepherd. And he loves being our good shepherd. And friends, this is amazing when you consider sheep. I think we often think, you know, he's the shepherd. We're just a little sheep, you know, going along. This is so cute. We're just a little sheep. Not so much. Not so much. In fact, I want to show you um, a video. I showed the, the great hall last week. Um, I want to show you what it's like. Now, you can't see this too well, but there's a guy, young shepherd boy. There's a sheep that's stuck in a rut. Okay. He's down in this, in this kind of canal they've been digging. And he's down there. He has, he, I mean, he's dying down there if the shepherd doesn't get him. So, so this young boy is there. He's going to pull him out. He's got a strap. He's got his back leg. The sheep is like, what are you doing? You know, he's no, and he has no idea what's happening. But the shepherd's trying to save his life. And he does, in fact. It's a beautiful thing. He's free. He's bounding. He's jumping away. He, wait, wait. Oh, he wins right. He's right back. He's right back in there. I mean, that, they're going to have to get him out again. Now, here's the sequel to this, another one. Look, this shepherd pulls him out. Look at, oh, green pastures. Yes, he sends him out. Uh, and he is going to go, uh, he's. So, here's what you learn. On, 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 in the interwebs, you learn there, there are actually sheep advocates that are out there. They say they're not that dumb. They're as smart as cows, they argue. <laughs> if you've been around cows, much. Um, now, I want to just see that because, friends, we laugh. Let's be, let's be clear about this. That is us. That's me. That is you. We need a shepherd. Amen? Friends, we need a shepherd. How many have fallen into a rut this week? How many of you, uh, like over and over get like me? He, he never tires of coming after us. And yet, Jesus tells us, we, if we, we don't turn to him, we settle for, for false sheep. We run after other sheep. See, the very fact that we're seeking out others to guide us and lead us and tell us what to do is proof of the fact that we are longing for a shepherd. And Jesus says in verse 12, look at this. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand. He cares nothing for the sheep. Brothers and sisters, listen to this. There are a million people out there who want to capture your attention and tell you how to live your life. Who are you prone to go to? You see, if we're not going to Jesus, if we're not hearing from him, if we're not dwelling in his presence, abiding in him, we are running to so many people. And and we need to humble ourselves because there are a million people out there who are going to tell you what to believe, how to act, who to fear, and who to hate. And if we're not listening to our Savior, we're going to be off track. And they're like hired hands. And they don't care anything about you. Many of us are listening to people who don't care anything. You don't even know them. They don't know you, and we're listening to people. The Pharisees, in the same way, say, come to us. We'll tell you how to live. Jesus says, no, no, no. Come to me. Come to me. 
I'm your good shepherd. Because notice too, the sheep are exposed to danger when they're not with the shepherd. He knows them, he has said. He knows them by name, he knows them. Which is why he comes to this, like a multiple flocks, and he says, all right, let's go. And the sheep follow that shepherd. Sheep don't know much, but they know the shepherd's voice. That's what Jesus is saying here. And, and, and I hear so many people who are just so fearful, so many Christians, fearful in our culture today. Friends, our fear is proof that we're not hanging close to the shepherd, where we find our identity, we find our confidence, we find our courage in him. I, I mean, I hear, I hear Christians, you know, in, in this growing, secularized, pluralistic society, pluralistic, which it is what it is. It's not, not evil, it just means multiple opinions, different takes on all kinds of things. And so many of us are thinking, you know, I hear people, Christianity is under attack in America. I would say, okay, comfortable Christianity is under attack in America. Christian comfort is under attack. I mean, come with me right, to India where radical Hindus are coming after our mission partners. I've, I've said it. They would come, come, to, come, come, come to India, now, uh, to, to Nepal or Bangladesh and other places. Now, we don't go to these places where it's too scary. I was in Nigeria many years ago which now is one of the most dangerous places on the planet to be a Christian. I mean, let's talk about persecution, not just difference of opinion. And I get it. We are seeing a radical shift that I've talked about a lot in our culture today. But how do we live in this kind of a culture? And I thought this week, wouldn't it be great if we had a model that would show us how to be his sheep in a growing pluralistic society? the New Testament. In the book of Acts, the epistles, the church in the New Testament is in a missionary posture in a growing, secularized, pluralistic culture. And then I thought, wouldn't it be great if we had a model of how an individual is to live in that kind of context? Jesus, our good shepherd, shows us exactly how to live that way. Friends, don't be deceived. You need our good shepherd today. But I think maybe the greater problem for us is that we don't know who our good shepherd really is. Again, this presumed familiarity. I don't think we understand how much he loves us. Because you look at that, you know, that little video there and, 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 and we see sheep just being so, so, can I say it, so stupid. Jesus never retires and he never tires of coming after us. As, as, as much as we fail him, as much as we turn away from him, in fact, it's what he does. His love is triggered by our need for him. So let's focus on the love of the shepherd. In verse 4, again, he's already said that each of his sheep, uh, he knows them by name and they know him. And here he says in verse 14 again, I am the good shepherd. I, I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And look at this. I lay down my life for the sheep. He is the good shepherd. Don't miss that. I've noted too that he, I love these personal pronouns here. It's like uh, in Psalm 23 that we just heard earlier. The Lord is my shepherd, right? He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. And it, it, you know, he, it, he focuses there on these personal pronouns. But I think what David is doing in Psalm 23, he's flipping the inflection. He's saying this, friends, no, 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 watch this. The Lord, God Almighty, is my shepherd. He's the one who makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. Look at my shepherd. See, the problem is for so many of us, we, we fall into all kinds of worry and anxiety and fear because we're looking at our circumstances and all that has happened even what we have done instead of looking at the good shepherd friends be reminded today he loves you and he never tires of turning to you and what's really fascinating as well when you think about a shepherd his sheep are his prized possessions see a shepherd everything he owns is in his flock which is why Jesus is saying, you are my treasure. The Bible tells us over and over again, we are his prized possession. We are his own possession, it says 
We are his treasured possession. He's called us out of the darkness into his marvelous light. And his glory is revealed. Watch this. His glory is revealed through the fact that he's rescued us from our sin. In fact, I love what it says in Ephesians 2, 7. We've been saved, brought into the sheepfold. Listen to this. So that in the coming ages, God might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. It says, you have become a trophy of his grace. See, the very fact that we leave him and have run from him and he comes after us amplifies his grace. It's what he loves to do. Your sin doesn't repel the Savior, regardless of what you've done. Instead, your sin triggers his love toward you. That's his heart. It's what he does. It's what it means to be the good shepherd. Look at verse 16. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. What are these other sheep? Well, he's talking about the Gentiles outside the Jewish. Any Gentiles here today? Raise your hand if you're a Gentile. That's all of us. Y'all know this. We're late to the game. You know this, right? He says, We've got, I've got other sheep, praise be to God. I must bring them in also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Look at this. There's one flock precisely because there's one shepherd. And I know this is, you know, going against the grain in, a, again, a growing secularized pluralistic society. Because it's like, man, that sounds exclusive. Like, Really? Is Jesus the only way? Wouldn't it make more sense that you could, you know, kind of pick and choose? Not, not any one religion. I'd be so prideful to think they're the only way. Wouldn't it be, like I've talked to people who are like, well, you know, what do you do? Well, I just, I mean, I think all truth is God's truth. And it is where you find truth. And so I just kind of pick and choose. I mean, I've got friends who are, you know, Muslim or whatever else, Hindu or something else or not, you know, secular people. But I, I mean, it's all, it's all good out there. But play that out. Who's deter- in your scenario, in that scheme, who's deciding what's truth and not truth? You are, right? I am. So, if I, so I've got this religion, it's called Jeff, and um, I'm the God of my religion because I determine what's right and wrong. I will determine how one achieves salvation in this secular schema is what it is. I will determine what's truth. How about this? My preferences will become truth for me. Not, not God's word, not what he has said. That's why people say, you know, challenge, challenges with the all roads lead to heaven. And I've said it this way. I, okay, first, what do you mean by heaven? If you mean where God is, because that's, that's heaven, uh, where he is present, um, I would say, okay, I'll give you this. All roads lead to God. All roads lead to God. Hebrews 8, I mean, Hebrews 9, 27, it says this. Just as appointed one to, for man to die once, we all die, every one of us die, and then face judgment before God Almighty. So Christ, having been offered once, and the writer of Hebrews says, once and for all to bear the sins of many, he'll appear a second time, not to deal with sin because he already has on the cross and his perfect life, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Look, those who believe, coming back to take us home. This we get back to what Tim Keller called the, uh, the inclusive exclusivity of the gospel. Watch this, everyone's included because there's only one way and it's through Jesus Christ. And if you think you're somehow going to work your way to God or be smart enough to get to God, you don't know our holy God. There's no way. You can't do anything to get to him. And so I think what, what's happening here, we, we've got to understand we need a longing for the shepherd. And it'll, be, it'll result in dwelling in him and abiding in him, receiving his love over and over again, being reminded of how much he loves you. So as we think about the love of the shepherd, this draws us into the life with the shepherd. This is that Zoe life again. Look at verse 17. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Now watch this. Look at his authority. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Look at this. His intention is to lay down his life. Wow, what a savior. What a good shepherd. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I've received from 
my father, he wants to lay his life down. Unlike thieves and robbers and hired hands, look at verse 25. After some bantering back and forth a bit in verse 25, he says, and he answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. We're talking a lot about this in these days. Um, in fact, connect group leaders are meeting just after this service for lunch. You can come join us. If you are a connect group leader, we'll make room for you. But we're saying this, look, being a disciple is not a, bod- it's not a, uh, a body of content. Being a disciple is not a body of knowledge. There's, there are things to know. Being a disciple is a skill set. And the skill set is here. As sheep, we know the good shepherd. We hear his voice. And we obey him. That is the Christian life. And look at verse 28. I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. Now two times he uses a Greek construction that's rare. Ume. Ume. It means never, never. It's an emphatic statement. They will never, ever perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. No one is ever, never able to snatch them out. I and the father are one. Now, this picture is showing us the power of a hand that no one can get anything out of. You cannot take it out. You can't, you can't remove the person who's received salvation. They will forever be held by God Almighty. And watch this. Even you can't snatch yourself out of his hand. And so we need to be reminded of this. In fact, in John 6, 37, he says this, all that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, here's that that construction again, I will never cast out. Whoever comes to him and believes, he will never cast out. Friends, you need to be reminded today, if you've received Christ, your, your eternal life in him is secure. No one will ever snatch you out of his hands not even yourself see but but what if i I keep going astray we we ask what what if no no what if no you will there's no if you're gonna go astray charles spurgeon helps us here look at this again he says this the first sinner says "Well, well i feel like i haven't repented enough that i'm not broken enough over my sin." The second center says, I feel that I have not had the emotional experiences that other people have had. The third one says, I feel like I don't have enough faith. And then he asks this, does Jesus say whoever repents enough, I'll never cast out? Does he say whoever has emotional experiences enough, I'll never cast out? Does he say whoever has enough faith, I'll never cast out? He says, he says, no, no, no. When whoever comes to me, I will never, ever cast out. This is an amazing reality. Again, your sin, friends, listen, whatever you do, whatever you've done, does not repel the Savior, but instead turns him toward you. It's why when he goes after the one we read earlier. Oh, haven't you wondered about that? Like, why does he go? What about the 99? They've all been, like, faithful. Why does he go? Because the one amplifies his glory and his grace and his love. He loves going after the one. So if you feel like the one today, friends, he's coming after you. When we look at our circumstances, when we look at our troubles, when we look at all that we're facing, we are overwhelmed and led to worry, anxiety, and hopelessness. But when we look at our Savior, When we know who our good shepherd is, we're filled with confidence and hope because he receives us. And he says, come, follow me. I have great plans for you. I have an abundant life here and now for you. Friends, when I look at my sin, listen, I wonder how in the world can I be saved? But when I look at my Savior, I wonder how in the world can I be lost? He never lets us go. And he is chasing after you today. 
And it is to his glory, it is great joy that he would pardon and relieve and comfort and come after you. And he's calling you to him today. The good shepherd has become the sacrificial lamb who's taken away our sin if only we will turn to him and follow him. And so what I want us to do, I would love for you to just close your eyes, bow your head. And I know the spirit of God has been speaking to you. And I want to ask you, what is the shepherd saying to you today? I think you've heard it. I think you've heard it through our singing, through the power of the spirit speaking into our hearts today, regardless of what you think you have been hearing from God. The scripture says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is what our good shepherd is saying to you right now. Friend, listen. I love you. Don't be afraid. I am with you. You can come home. You can come to me. And friend, if you've never received his grace, now is the time to believe. Revelation 21, 17 says, no one who dies in their sin will ever enter into heaven except for those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Those who believe. So say yes to him. Friend, if you've never received his grace, if you have questioned your salvation, if you wonder if you're saved, confirm it right now. Lord, I give you my life. I know that your grace is greater than my sin. I don't comprehend it. I can't fully grasp it because it is so amazing. But I give you my life. Thank you for dying on the cross and settling it all once and for all. I give you my life that I would dwell in you and walk with you to bring glory to you. Even in my failing, you rescue me that I might point others to you. So Lord, we love you. We thank you today that you are our good shepherd. How we praise you for our church family. That we have each other to guide and to lead and to comfort. May we shepherd others well this week. In your name we pray. Everyone said, amen. Praise be to God.